Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Matt Littman, Executive Director of 97%. So we are honored to have Dr. Joy Losey from the University of Dayton and Dr. Michael Siegel from Boston University joining us. They're both fantastic researchers. They're gonna discuss empirically backed ideas for involving gun owners in the gun violence conversation. Dr. Siegel, almost every time I look up information on gun owners, when I Google it, your research comes up all the time. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Losey, this would be a good opportunity for you to tell everybody what your Twitter handle is. <laughs> Jim and Joy. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you. Two lies. <laughs> if people have questions, they should just put them in. There's a spot for questions, and then we'll try to get to what we can get to. We're not going to get to everybody. Uh, but thank you for asking questions. And now I turn it over to Dr. Losey. You're going to start us off, right? All right, thank you. thank you. All right, um, so yes, I want to thank you all for being here today. I wanna to thank Dr. Siegel for inviting me out for this talk. Um, so um, I'm going to just briefly present some research that I've been doing. Um, some of, well, most of it was done at the University of Florida um, uh, with my colleagues there, but we've been looking at the psychological underpinnings to the political divide on gun attitudes and gun policy preferences. So um, it is not controversial to say that most people agree that gun violence is um, a problem. Um, the controversy tends to lie in people's solutions to this problem. Um, and the solutions to the, to the gun violence problem tend to fall into big categories. So there's policies um, that uh, decrease guns. So these are things like assault weapon, assault weapon bans, um, you know, increasing background checks and things like that. And then there's policies um, that increase guns. So these would be things that like arming teachers and schools and things like that. Now, if I wanted to know uh, which of these policies you support or might have more support for, um, it would be good for me to know your political ideology. So it is the case that uh, people who are more liberal, um, which tends to correlate with being a Democrat, tend to support policies that de decrease guns more, whereas people who are more conservative, who also tend to be more Republican, tend to support policies um, that increase guns. Um, so, uh, although that's interesting to know, it doesn't necessarily tell us why that difference exists. Um, so why is it the case that people support one policy over the other? Um, and that's what my colleagues and I set out to do with our research. So in this case, we specifically asked, why do liberals oppose and conservatives support um, increasing guns? And I say increasing guns because we were focusing on um, a specific law um, that's proposed from time to time in the Florida state legislature to um, allow concealed carry on college campuses. Um, and so that's the specific policy that this research focused on, although the framework for testing these ideas could be used to assess um, responses to other, um, other policies. So in this particular study, uh, we collected data from about 12,000 University of Florida faculty, staff, and students. Um, we conducted the study um, during October and November of 2018. And in this study, uh, participants completed a survey. And at the beginning of the survey, they completed a random order of what we call our mediator variables, or the variables that are supposed to explain the relationship between political ideology and support for concealed campus carry. Um, they completed a random order of outcome variables. In this case, I'm only going to talk about support for concealed campus carry. Um, and they uh, completed measures of demographics and their political ideology. Um, so uh, in our data, we found that the correlation between political ideology and support for concealed campus carry was uh, 0.65. Um, and if you're not familiar with correlations, they go from zero to one, uh, with one being a perfect correlation and zero being no correlation. So 0.65 is pretty big, um, which really speaks to that idea that if I know your political ideology, I can reasonably predict within some error um, your position on, um, on uh, concealed campus carry. 
So as we were going into explaining this relationship and trying to figure out why this relationship exists, we went through the literature and we tried to find as many potential psychological explanations for the divide as we could. Um, and so we were looking for variables that tended to relate to political ideology. And we were also looking for variables that have been related to gun attitudes and gun policy preferences and other research. Um, and so our, after we got finished searching for all of these different um, possible explanations, they all sort of fit into these three different categories. So I'm gonna go through each category one by one. So the first category is uh, general threat perception. Um, and people tend to differ in the extent to which they are sensitive to threat. Some people are more sensitive to threat. Pe some people perceive threat more readily than others. Um, and this has tended to be linked with higher levels of conservatism in the psychology research. Um, and now there's a ton of different variables that have been related, um, a ton of different general threat perception variables that have related to conservatism. The two that we picked out to look at were um, uncertainty avoidance and belief in a dangerous world. Now, uncertainty avoidance is sort of an individual difference that all people have where they are more or less comfortable with uncertainty. So some people find uncertainty and ambiguity, and ambiguity incredibly um, distressing, whereas others are less bothered by it. Um, and then in addition, uh, people also differ in the extent to which they view the world as dangerous, and the extent that they see the world as scary. Um, and both of these things in the past have been linked with higher levels of conservatism. So we reasoned maybe it's the case that people who are experiencing these higher levels of threat also would rather have a more serious form of protection like a gun on them. Um, an additional uh, couple of variables that we were looking at were uh, people's um, perception of their power. So this is where we uh, developed our uh, perceived relative power loss measure. Um, and basically this just measures the extent to which people feel that they have less power than they should or feel that they have less power than they used to. Um, and ideas like this have tended to relate to uh, more positive gun attitudes or more gun ownership and things like that. Um, and then the third, the fourth variable that we looked at within this section was um, government threats. So a lot of people report um, wanting to have a gun on them um, to protect themselves from potentially oppressive government. Um, so when it comes to explaining the relationship between political ideology and support for concealed campus carry, none of these variables uh, significantly uh, statistically mediated the relationship, um, which basically just means that um, we didn't find that, you know, conservatives were necessarily higher in any of these variables um, and that high levels of these variables related to um, support for concealed campus carry. So this kind of uh, led us to believe that, you know, Differences in general threat perception are not necessarily a good explanation um, for the difference between liberals and conservatives on uh, concealed campus carry uh, policy preferences. So our next group of variables have to do with culture and identity. So when we're talking about culture, we're talking about constellation of values and beliefs. And when we're talking about identity, I'm specifically talking about things that are part of your self-concept. And I'll explain a little bit more about what I mean here on the next slide. So we found um, a couple of different cultural uh, values and beliefs that tend to be more, hi more highly related to conservatism in the literature and have also been shown to be related to um, gun attitudes. And so those two uh, values are traditional masculinity and uh, this perception of the person as being responsible for their own safety. So with traditional masculinity, this is just kind of the idea that manhood is something that must be earned and it must be maintained. Um, and that has been uh, at higher levels that has tended to be linked to more conservative attitudes. Um, in addition, those attitudes have also, traditional masculinity attitudes have also been linked to higher levels um, of uh, gun ownership, um, gun, uh, Okay. gun ownership, more positive gun attitudes and things like that. Um, and the same is true for personal responsibility for safety. So this is sort of people's view that 
the individual is responsible for their safety, as opposed to maybe the government or the police or the community or something like that. Um, and the literature has shown that uh, this sort of personal responsibility thing has also been um, conservatism in the past. Um, finally, when it comes to um, identity and self-concept, uh, people are either gun owners or they're not, right? So your identity is essentially you either are or are not a gun owner. If you own a gun, you are a gun owner. If you don't own one, you are a non-gun owner. Um, however, there are individual differences in the extent to which people have incorporated that identity into their self-concept. And so we reasoned that people who had incorporated that identity more into their self-concept would um, have more support for policies that increase guns. And essentially, we found um, that um, across these three variables, they did statistically mediate the relationship between um, political orientation and um, preference for uh, concealed campus carry, meaning that uh, conservatives were higher in traditional masculinity, per, uh, perceived personal responsibility for safety, and for seeing gun ownership as part of, of their self-concept. And those variables also correlated with a higher preference for concealed campus carry. Our last um, explanatory variable that we looked into uh, was safety needs. Everyone has a need to feel safe. It's just that liberals and conservatives differ in the way that they achieve their safety needs. So liberals tend to see guns as a threat to safety, whereas conservatives tend to see guns as a means to safety. Um, and that differing view of guns as a means or a threat to safety also um, has a strong correlation with people's um, preferences for gun policies. And so we found that this variable was the strongest statistical mediator of the relationship between political ideology um, and uh, concealed campus carry. So uh, just real quick, um, basically when it comes to the relation, what underlies the relationship between uh, political ideology and concealed campus carry preference, the variables that seem to be working here are things that have to do with culture and identity and things that have to do with how people achieve their safety needs. I just want to point out a few limitations to this work uh, before I finish up here. So I just want to point out that this data was collected from a single university, um, the University of Florida. So we have to cautiously try to generalize these um, findings to other universities and other situations. It was a very large data set, and it was largely representative in many demographic ways to the U.S. population, but that's a point of caution. Um, then I, I just want to point out one other thing, which is something that I've been considering quite a bit in my newer research moving forward. And I've simply been asking, does explaining the political divide on gun policy actually get us closer to addressing gun violence? So the idea is, if we can address this political divide, that will stop the stalemate um, for for addressing gun violence with policy, um, and then we will have policies. Um, but uh, this work that I just presented to you doesn't um, account for race, which does have, play a big role in the gun violence situation in the U.S. Um, and so specifically, Black people in the U.S. are ex experiencing a disproportionate level of gun violence. And then in addition to that, kind of adding some nuance to the situation, gun control also has a racist history and can increase people's exposure to police brutality. So there's some more nuance that needs to be considered there. Um, so I just went back to the data and I wanted to see, you know, for black participants, is political ideology an important predictor of um, support for concealed campus carry? And I found that there was no relationship between political ideology and support for concealed campus carry among our black participants, um, but the correlation was still 0.65 among our non-black participants. Um, so just wanted to leave people with a thought that, you know, addressing the problem with gun violence probably means centering the people who are most affected by gun violence. And we probably need to start asking questions about what predicts um, support for opposition to um, gun policies among Black people in the U.S. and what policies will address the safety needs of those communities specifically. Um, all right. So I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, these are my colleagues here, and I want to thank them for all their help with this work. And uh, I will pass it on to Dr. Siegel now. Thank you so much, Dr. Losi. Thanks for that excellent and clear presentation um, and really intriguing research, which my, my presentation is actually going to um, build on and actually incorporate. Um, so I want to talk about the, the theme of this conference, which is bridging the divide 
bringing gun owners and non-gun owners together. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my um, collaborator, uh, Claire Braun, who we will meet later, um, also from the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this research was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Evidence for Action Program, uh, and that the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the foundation. So the very first question that probably comes to mind is why? Why does it matter? Why are we talking about bridging the divide? Why are we talking about bringing gun owners into the debate? Uh, why are we talking about getting gun owners or engaging gun owners in gun violence prevention? What difference does that make? And the answer I think is quite simple. It's a game changer. Um, if you don't know this gentleman, this is Mariano Rivera. He's a was the closer for the for the New York Yankees for many years. And basically, when this guy came on in the ninth inning, you knew the game was over. Um, he was a game changer. And so the way I, I would describe it is, you know, if we were at a legislative hearing and we had five or six gun owners get up one after the other and all testify in support of gun violence prevention legislation, we could all sit back and it would be like watching Mariano Rivera run to the mound from the bullpen. It would be a game changer. We would know that we were, uh, we were in good shape. Um, how do we know that this is the case? Well, my experience really comes from tobacco control. And we have a long history of, of uh, understanding the way that big tobacco fought gun, or sorry, tobacco policies. And the way that they did this was by pitting smokers against non-smokers. Um, that's the way they wanted the battle to be perceived. And just as the NRA uh, and the gun lobby uh, have convinced us that this is a battle of gun owners versus non-gun owners, the tobacco industry convinced the public that this was a battle between smokers and non-smokers. In fact, the created a uh, uh, alliance called the National Smokers Alliance. This was actually not a citizens group, as it sounds like. It wasn't an alliance of smokers who got together uh, to fight for their rights. This was a Philip Morris funded uh, front group that essentially uh, the group funded to make it look like there were a lot of smokers out there who were fighting against non-smokers. Um, one of the very first pieces of research that I did was uh, showing that secondhand smoke affected not just customers, but employees, and shifting the frame with which we looked at this issue from one of smokers versus non-smokers to one of the public, smokers and non-smokers alike, versus big tobacco. And in fact, what resulted was uh, the majority of smokers began to support smoking bans. And that was the game changer. Once we had smokers coming out and, and saying, we support these smoking bans, we support increasing taxes on cigarettes, it was, it was over. The game was over at that point. We were able to defeat big tobacco and eventually get congressional legislation passed um, because it was no longer an issue of smokers versus non-smokers. So the, the key really was treating smoking as a public health issue not as a battle between smokers and non-smokers. And so this, this tobacco you know, history is what leads me to, uh, and Claire, to hypothesize that the key in the, the gun violence uh, issue is similar. It's to treat gun violence as a public health issue, not as a battle between gun owners and non-gun owners. Now, that raises the question, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to treat an issue like gun violence as a public health issue? Now, you hear that all the time. I've heard that from many, many different groups and uh, saying, you know, yeah, we want to, this needs to be looked at as a public health issue. But what does it mean? What does that really mean to say we're going to look at this as a public health issue? Well, what I think it means is in a public health issue, the thing that characterizes it is that we don't make value judgments on the people who are undertaking the risky behavior, right? In the tobacco control movement, what really changed the movement was when instead of blaming smokers and, and pitting this as smokers versus non-smokers, we basically said, hey, this is a public health issue. Smoking is something that affects the public. It's not their fault. It's their, they are, they are part of the public. They deserve to be treated and helped. 
and we brought smokers into the fold. In fact, smokers were very involved in litigation against the tobacco industry. They were involved in lobbying for protections for their own welfare. Uh, and we didn't make value judgments on smokers. We didn't view smokers as saying, you know, well, this is their fault. Um, they're making a mistake. Uh, they're bad people because of it. Well, we should be doing the same in gun, in the gun violence area. And this leads to a huge problem. And this has to do with what Dr. Losey talked about. And that problem is that not making value judgments would mean, by definition, that we would have to respect the decision of gun owners to own a gun for self-defense. And from the seven years that I've been in this field, I believe that the main message and the main belief that people in gun violence prevention have had is that guns do not provide protection uh, and that therefore we don't respect people's decisions to carry a gun for self-defense. And that's the message that I think we have largely been sending to gun owners, not necessarily explicitly, but implicitly through, um, through our language and through a lot of the policies that we've been supporting. And this leads to an inherent conflict with the values of gun owners. The key to effective communication uh, is to always reinforce existing values of the target audience, never to challenge or oppose them. And to demonstrate this, I just want to show you the, the text of a uh, public service announcement that I'll read this to you because it's, it's, it's small. Uh, but this was a public service announcement that was put out in Maine to support a public policy initiative that was going to be on the ballot that had lost the previous year. Uh, and this was a campaign. And it demonstrates I won't tell you what the issue is, but you'll figure it out. Um, this campaign worked and reversed, completely reversed public opinion because it acknowledged, it starts by acknowledging the values of the target audience. So and each of these lines was said by a different person, but I'll just be re reading the whole thing. So the commercial said, something happens when you cross the border into the state. It's not that the water changes or the mountains. There's just something about Maine that makes it different. It's the people, Maine ways, Maine ways. Whether you're born here or move here, it gets into your blood. It's how you're brought up. You know, in Maine, no one tells anyone how to live. We all share Maine values, Maine values, fairness, respect for each other, strong and healthy families, we know that the best way to protect and raise kids is in a loving and committed family, where all families are accepted. We don't make one set of rules for some and another set for others. That's why everyone should be free to marry the person they love here in Maine, together, 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 we can protect equality. That was a game changer. <laughs> Uh, it completely reversed the vote, and the very next uh, legislative uh, or the, the very next election cycle, um, Maine overwhelmingly passed legalization of same sex marriage. And what happened to change that was simply that people's values were being affirmed rather than being interfered with. So the question then rises what are the main values of gun owners? Uh, if we want to be able to assert the values of gun owners, and reinforce those values, we need to know what they are. So the study that um, that Claire and, and I did was a survey, a national survey of gun owners, and we basically found two main values that overrode all of the other values. And the first one was exactly what Dr. Losey talked about. We found that 86% of gun owners, what really brought them together was the belief that guns protect, that they are protected by having a gun. And the second thing that brought them together was the belief that beyond just being uh, a tool for protection, guns were also a symbol of freedom. About two thirds, close to two thirds of gun owners believe that. Um, interestingly, what brought gun owners together was not the traditional uh, things that you would think of, like gun identity, feeling like a gun owner, believing that you're a gun owner. It was these two things, the protective value of guns, and viewing guns as a symbol of freedom. So 
if we think about that, um, why is it why is it that we found in this survey that non that gun owners are not engaged in gun violence prevention? And we asked them that question directly. We said, why aren't you involved if they weren't involved in in gun violence prevention? Um, and this was to people who said they supported background checks, they supported red flag laws, um, they supported these policies, but why weren't they involved? And the main reason they gave was that they feel their values are being opposed. Um, first, the fact that guns are protective, uh, 45%, about half of them felt that there was a lack of respect for their decision to own a gun for self-protection. And when you feel that you're not being respected, you're not gonna go out and, and be part of a movement. And second, there was a conflict with their feeling that guns symbolize freedom. 59% uh, thought that advocates were trying to, or that advocates are trying to take their guns away. 62% believe that advocates do not respect uh, gun culture. And so what is essentially happening is that gun owners we found are being alienated because rather than asserting and reinforcing and acknowledging their values, most of the messages that, messages that they're getting are directly opposing those values. And, and that's not a way in which you can ever engage people in either discussion or in policy, um, you know, finding policy solutions or much less supporting those policy solutions. So the only viable strategy based on our research is to engage, to get, engage gun owners is basically, unfortunately, to basically have to say, we're not going to take your guns. That fear of having their guns taken is a is a, a non-starter, and it has to be taken off the table if we ever want to be able to talk to gun owners. The second thing is we have to respect their decision to own a gun for self-defense. We don't have to agree with that decision, but we have to at least respect it. And I think the third thing is that instead of taking the instead of putting the focus on taking away some guns from all people, the goal really needs to be taking guns away, taking all guns away from some people. So in conclusion, the two most critical values that gun owners seem to have are the value of guns in protection and guns as a symbol of freedom. Um, a key principle of engagement is that you have to reaffirm rather than oppose existing values. And therefore, you know, our final conclusions are that essential to gain the trust of gun owners is number one, taking banning guns off the table. Number two, respecting the decision, their decision to own guns for self-defense. And number three, taking the blame off law-abiding gun owners by focusing on restricting all guns from the highest risk people rather than putting such a focus on taking certain types of guns away from even law-abiding citizens. And we think that if those three principles are followed, we can get gun owners into the discussion. Um, we can in engage them in gun violence prevention. And we think that that can and will be a game changer. So thank you very much. At this point, we're going, going to um, open it up for questions. Um, so you'll see there's a button um, that says ask a question. And if you just click on that button, you can type in your question and um, it will come in uh, and we'll, we'll see it and I can, um, I can pass that along. So the first question we get, uh, we have here um, is for Dr. Losi and it is, uh, what was your sample drawn from the university community or the broader state of Florida? Um, it was a university of Florida sample. Um, so, it was not just uh, students and faculty, though. We also included uh, staff. So we had a, a wide range of perspectives. Okay. Um, another question that came in is the gun owner versus non-gun owner uh, does not include the gun in the household, but do not own the gun individual, which is a huge number of people in the U.S. Is this a third category that we should divide people into, especially as it applies to attitudes and beliefs? Um, I guess, Dr. Losi, let me give that to you first and see. I know that um, your your group has done work on um, gun owners and, and non-gun owners, and you've divided gun owners, I know, into different groups. Some are protective and some are non-protective. So 
Um, have you done any work with people who own a gun but really don't um, don't use it? <laughs> they just have it there and and don't necessarily see defensive value in it. Um, yeah, so we um, have done research where we look at this sort of third group of people who are associated with guns in some uh, way. And um, yeah, so people, we typically will categorize people into that group if they own guns just for recreation reasons, if it's part of their job, um, if it was a, an heirloom um, or something like that. Um, and it does seem to, so it seem to be the case that people who, um, who have guns for those reasons tend to have attitudes and profiles that look more similar to non-gun owners. Um, so people who own guns for protection reasons tend to have a different profile, um, than people who are non-gun owners or who don't own guns for protection reasons. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Lucy. There's a series of, of, of questions here, which I think are, are questioning some of the premises that I, um, suggested. And so I want to kind of tackle them because I think they're really great questions. Um, so one is... Um, who have you seen in the gun violence prevention movement in recent years stating that they want to remove guns? You know, the problem is disinformation from the NRA who claims that everything is the slippery slope toward taking guns away. So first of all, there's absolutely no question that the primary thing that's driving this belief among gun owners that the gun violence prevention movement wants to take their guns away is the NRA and it's, it's propaganda. That has been the main message that the NRA has been putting out for um, basically since 1977 or so. So, you know, after three or four decades of, of putting out that message, gun owners have, got, have come to, to believe it. So I think it's, it's not the case that, you know, this is in some case, in, in some way, our fault in public health. This is the NRA. This is the NRA's doing. It's been part of their, um, their strategy. Uh, just like the tobacco industry were the ones who divided smokers and, and non-smokers, that wasn't a natural break. Um, the the uh, NRA and the gun lobby has created this, this kind of myth that there are two types of people out there, gun owners and non-gun owners. So absolutely, the NRA has created this. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I do think that there are things that, that the gun violence prevention movement has done that have exacerbated this problem or have fed into it or suggested to gun owners that they're that the NRA is right. Um, and so, you know, one thing is the, and I, I know this is this is going to be controversial, and you know, I, I hope that it's uh, something that we can we can discuss throughout the day. But I think that the the overwhelming um, emphasis on assault weapon bans is a really good example. Um, we did say that we're going to take people's guns away. Assault weapon bans do take people's guns away. Now, are they guns that people, you know, responsible people should have? Well, probably not. But nevertheless, it is taking people's guns away. And so when you when you have a climate in which one of the number one policies that is at the top of the agenda is an assault weapons ban, and when anytime there's a mass shooting, the very first policy that people in the gun violence prevention movement are calling for are assault weapons bans. It's difficult to argue that we're not playing any role in feeding into the NRA rhetoric because we're directly calling for these guns to be to be removed. Um, and, you know, can't uh, Beto O'Rourke, as we all know, um, directly said that not only should we ban these guns, but he said he was coming for people's guns. You know, that's really, really destructive. Um, in terms of gun owners, in terms of their perceptions, uh, because it feeds directly into the NRA rhetoric. John Paul Stevens, former Supreme Court justice, uh, wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying we should get rid of the Second Amendment. You know, these, these types of statements, um, they, they're noticed. They're noticed by gun owners, and they do feed into this mindset of... Um, you know, this slippery slope. Um, another question that I wanted to field is, isn't it true that guns actually do not provide personal protection? Guns can be used by aggressors against the gun owner. They can be used to commit suicide, perpetrate domestic violence, facilitate accidents, 
in the home, um, et cetera. And then a, a similar question says, you know, well, no one tells smokers that cigarettes are healthy. So in, I'm by no means arguing that, that that's wrong. And in fact, that's what the conundrum is. The conundrum is that the facts show that owning a gun is in, is going to increase your risk of um, of violence. You know, you're more likely to have the gun used against you than than against some stranger wandering into the house. There's no question that the science shows that owning a gun on a population level makes you less safe. Um, just as with smoking, there's no question that the data shows that smoking is harmful. But you don't have to tell people that uh, the question, the problem isn't changing our belief and lying to people. The problem is whether or not you respect someone's decision. And in public health, one of our basic principles is that we respect the decisions that people make, even when they're unhealthy. You know, we don't draw lines. We don't draw, draw moral lines. We don't, we don't make moral statements out of people's decisions, even when they're unhealthy. Um, you know, people who wear masks, who don't wear masks during COVID, you know, I find that reprehensible. But as a public health practitioner, I can't make a moral judgment about that. Our goal is to try to reduce COVID to the extent possible. And that means our job is to try to get people who are not wearing masks to wear masks. Making value judgments is not something that we do. People who haven't gotten vaccinated, this is going to be a huge problem for public health um, that we're going to face in the next few months. Well, the answer of it, the answer is not to say, well, people who are doing this are irresponsible and, and we don't respect their decision. The answer is to try to find the barriers that are that are blocking their getting the vaccine and to try to break down those barriers. That's what public health is all about. You know, perhaps this is a this is a perfect way to kind of um, to kind of close as we we're we have just a few. Can I just left. add something real quick, Dr. Siegel? Sure. Um, I also just want to um, point out again that also we should also be aware of the nuance that comes along with gun control policies and things like that, and and know that you know just as maybe we're closing the door on one type of risk, we're opening the door on another type of risk, which is, again, risk to communities that are you know, heavily policed um, and risking exposing these communities to increased uh, police brutality. And I'm specifically talking about BIPOC communities. Um, and I saw some questions in here about that, and I just wanted to make sure that uh, I address that. Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. And, and there is a question, um, which I'll I'll get I'll give to you and because we do have a few more minutes and then I'll I'll kind of give a short summary to end. But um, there was a question: Guns protect is the logic behind stand your ground, which adversely affects Black and Brown people. Um, do you want to address that, Dr. Losey? Uh, again, I think that's another situation where there is um, a lot of nuance. Um, definitely, stand your ground laws um, do have that disproportionate effect. Um, but there is also on the other side of this also another effect where, you know, if the police are stopping people to see if they have guns in their car, they're stopping black people more than they're stopping, you know, white people and stuff like that. So that's what I'm saying to kind of be aware of when we're talking about uh, gun policy to talk about this, this sort of nuance. Um, yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up. And, and in fact, the very next session is going to focus on race and racism in, in the gun issue. Um, so that, that's a good segue into that. Um, let me close by, by going to one final question, which I think will allow me to kind of, kind of summarize um, the main point here. Um, so the question is, there seems to be a unified definition of gun. Isn't owning an assault type weapon an unreasonable right to provide personal protection? And so that is exactly what the what I think the problem is, is that most of us in gun violence prevention don't see any need for assault weapons. Um, why would you need such a thing? Why would you need these militarized weapons? And we, we may very well be right. There may not be any legitimate reason. The problem is that if someone makes a decision to own such an item, and they are a genuine part of the public, 
you know, we're not talking about part of the NRA or the NRA lobby or part of some insurrectionist group, but if it's just a, you know, a private citizen who makes such a decision, from a public health perspective, they are a member of the public. And in public health, it's really important that we don't make uh, value-based decisions and judgments about people's character based on health-related decisions that they make. So while it may be the case that it is a decision that is unreasonable uh, and, and just really plays has no role in, you know, our country, you know, so is so is drinking and then going in a car. Um, so is smoking pot and then getting behind the wheel. No, no, there's no room for that in our country. There's no room for people to be driving drunk in this country. Uh, there are many behaviors that people do that endanger others. And the key to having a public health perspective on the issue is that we try not to blame those people. Um, and that, I'm not talking about criminal, when you obviously, when there's criminal wrongdoing, we do. But just for having um, owning a gun, let's say, or for being a drinker or being a smoker or not wearing a mask, we our responsibility as public health practitioners is to protect the public's health. And what that means is that those are people who are in the public and it means engaging with them. And ultimately, I think that to really break this divide, what we need to do is we need to find a way to engage with gun owners. Not the NRA, not the gun lobby, but to engage with gun owners. And I'll just kind of leave you with this lasting image of what I think it really means to get gun owners involved. I mean, this is, this is really what I think it means is, is uh, having, having Mario and Rivera running out of the, of the bullpen. This is what we'll be able to see when we're in a legislative session and we're able to get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 gun owners in a row to get up and testify. We already have their support. We know that. We know we have overwhelming support and you'll hear about this in the third panel, for universal background checks and permit requirements and, and red flag laws and domestic violence uh, uh, laws. We already have that support. What we're not seeing are the bodies. We're not seeing the people. We're not seeing the gun owners get up there. And hopefully this research that Dr. Losi has done and that, that we have done um, will help us to find ways to engage gun owners in gun violence prevention, or, or at least I hope that this will at least start the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us.